The law that the judges applied in the early days of English law were of several different kinds, the most important of which was what has come to be called the common law. And that just meant it was the common law of England. Uh, it was based on customs. There was no legislature that enacted these laws, uh, but they just applied the customs. Uh, and that's the origin of the common law. And those were the customs that were common to all of England. Eventually, over a period of many centuries, uh, the judiciary became more specialized and the common law began to be found not so much by asking around to find out what the custom was, uh, but by interpreting uh, the cases in which judges had decided particular disputes on the basis uh, of these customs. Naturally and inevitably, as time went on, the common law really began to change. New questions came up, judges clarified things uh, in their opinions, and the practice developed of what we call stare decisis, which is Latin for let the decision stand or follow a precedent unless there's a very good reason not to. Those precedents accumulated over time and a kind of dynamic system arose in which judges made incremental changes, often without acknowledging it um, as time went on, and that became the common law of England. Uh, so the common law, it, it's interesting. That, that, that phrase is used to refer to several different things. One is the body of law that is developed by the royal courts uh, starting in the Middle Ages. Uh, and it's a body of law that deals with uh, a lot of different areas of what we would today call private law. So our law of torts, our law of contracts, things like that, uh, is sort of the body of the common law. Um, and then it's also often used to, uh, to describe a method. We talk about common law reasoning or a common law way of developing the law, which is to say that it's law that is developed by judges, not passed by a legislature. Uh, and that sort of, at least in its ideal, is meant to slowly accrete over time, build upon itself, uh, be based in precedent. So a judge today will refer to decisions made by uh, his or her predecessors. Um, uh, and, and so we refer to that as sort of common law reasoning or a common law methodology. Another kind of law that developed later was statutory law. Parliament had the power to change the common law or declare what it is, and statutes always overrode the common law in theory, although English judges were reluctant to conclude or interpret a statute in a way that conflicted with the common law. They indulged a kind of presumption that Parliament and the king, who together made statutes, uh, would not want to uh, change the common law unless they made it very clear. But in theory, stat statutes always could and often did override the common law. Well, there's this idea um, running through common law history that the common law is sort of based in reason and based in um, uh, sort of the reasoned development of principles that can be found out there in the world. We aren't making them up, we're discovering them. Statutes, on the other hand, are understood, at least by the courts, as being these sort of brute intrusions of the sovereign, right? That um, parliament comes in and sort of tears a hole in, in the what was previously the seamless, seamless web of the law. Um, and so judges try to, you know, they recognize that the, the, the brute you know, sovereign power can overpower them. Uh, so the statutes take precedence, but they, um, uh, you know, we try to minimize the damage that the, that the statutes are going to do. We try to uh, uh, interpret uh, them narrowly. So you, you get all kinds of principles of statutory interpretation, like uh, statutes and derogation of the common law should be narrowly construed, uh, things like that. Um, so you, you have sort of this constant back and forth uh, between parliament and the courts, uh, between statute law and, and common law. Um, uh, and then uh, 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 later as well between equity and the common law, this sort of uh, uh, new branch of law that, that, that arises out of um, uh, a sort of different group of royal officials, the, the chancellor uh, and, and various others, uh, trying to sort of do justice where they think the rigid principles of the common law fail. Um, so you have these, all these sources of law sort of swirling around uh, um, uh, in England, really between about the 13th century and the, and the 17th century, uh, and then uh, they sort of slowly become more and more um, systematized, more and more unified. Uh, the, the common law continued to govern uh, in the colonies uh, along with acts of parliament. Uh, when we separated from Great Britain 
uh, the new states, in one way or another, all simply adopted the common law, um, and it continued to develop in the states. Um, of course, the new state legislatures had the power to pass statutes that might be at variance with the common law, and they did that, and they continue to do that. The really momentous change came at the federal level. Um, in England, um, there was no difference between the highest court and the highest legislature. Parliament served both functions. And for that reason, lower courts could not overrule an act of parliament because they would simultaneously be overruling the highest court in the land. They did, however, exercise something like what we call judicial review in this country. Uh, the, the courts in England uh, would decline to enforce unconstitutional acts of the crown, and they would sometimes refuse to, uh, to help the crown uh, violate the English Constitution. The English Constitution, of course, is unwritten, unlike ours. So the momentous change came when we adopted a federal written constitution in which we separated the judicial function from the legislative function. And that created, for the first time, the possibility of a conflict between a statute and the Constitution. And that has had enormous consequences. Yeah.